heart this morning. Tell him what you need. Tell him what you want. We bless you, Father. We worship and praise you. So today, I believe that um, the message that the Lord has given me for us today, the title is, Who's Messing With Your Tree? Who's Messing With Your Tree? And I want you to, as we go through this, I want you to Imagine, visualize that a literal physical tree is similar to your life. We're, I'm calling you a tree because there are so many things in the Bible that calls you a tree. So we're thinking about the physical tree and we're thinking about you as a tree. But also I want you to think about the world. Uh, as we look at the tree, it has different parts, different functions. You are spirit, soul, and body. And then the world, the scripture says everything that you see is created by something that's not seen. Which means these chairs are you, that you're sitting on started out being something that you didn't see. It had to first appear in somebody's mind, which you don't see. So everything that you see is created from something or it is developed from something that's not seen, okay? So uh, I have five points. I want to make this so simple that if you mess up, it's going to be on you. I want it to be so easy to just see God's uh, message to you today. The first point is you are God's creation, God's personal design. God has prepared you. And the reason you need to know this, a lot of people are still doing, trying to become what their mamas told them they were supposed to be. Some of us had some, you know, when you grow up, uh, when you're a child, you have these um, ideas. I remember sitting on the steps with my little friend. I think we were probably five or six years old. And we used to cut out paper dolls. And we'd get, we'd get the Sears magazine because we didn't have all the color TV and sophistication that you all have today. So we would get the Sears book and we'd cut out like an RV camper. We were going to go camping, you know, and we'd have put our little stick people and pictures on these things. Well, that was our ideas. But as you grow and develop in the Lord, he reveals your purpose to you. You know, and typically... People say like T.D. Jakes and um, uh, Joyce Meyer, most of these people did not know as, as young people, much less children, really what God was going to do with their lives. And so, so many of us are still trying to pursue things that God has not directed us into. We have just chosen those areas for whatever reason. So the first thing I want you to understand is you are God's creation. Genesis says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then a little later, it says, God made man in his image, in their likeness, in the likeness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God created you. So you are spirit, soul, and body. There, you are three parts. So to just be uh, mental is not smart. To live out of your head is not a good thing 
because there's more to you. There are different layers to you. And when you learn to live from the inside out, you will become who God wants you to be. And it doesn't matter uh, where you are right now. We continually evolve until the day we die. And so many people, as they become mature, they get set in their ways. They get stuck. They get stuck in their house, their car. I can't even imagine telling myself, this is the last car I'll buy, or this is the last house I'll live in. I haven't gotten there. Hope I never get there, you know. So we're God's creation. We're his design, and he has prepared us. Okay, so the first scripture to support that is Ephesians, go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses, we're going to read 8, 9, and 10. So now I need you to keep a tree, yourself, and the world. God created the world. He created um, nature. And, and everything is kind of, God makes things so easy. You know, if you don't get it from reading a book, just look at nature. Look at children. Look at the natural order of things. And you can see who God is. There's no re reason for anybody to really not know God in some dimension. Okay. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. Let's all read that together. For we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. So as we're going to go on, we're going to see, was he the creator or the instrumental in what you're doing? Or was it somebody or something else? Or was it you? For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus Unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. And the word ordained, if you look in your uh, column where it'll interpret it for you, it says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before prepared. God prepared your life before your mother conceived you. Amen. He knew that today... September the 17th, you would be sitting at Salvation Temple Church in Hazel Park, Michigan. Amen. Okay? Your life is prepared already for you. So you shouldn't even be stressed or about anything. Nothing should be too much for you to handle because God has ordained you. Okay? So you're God's creation. He designed you personally and spiritually. Specifically, how many of you, uh, none of us in here have the same fingerprint. None of us in here have the same thought. Everybody who leaves here today, if I ask you what did that scripture mean to you, each one of you is going to have a different interpretation of, of Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Because when you heard it, it went through all of your filters. It went through how you were raised, your education, your culture, your experience of whether uh, you were successful. Uh, all of everything you do in this world goes through your filters. So that's why God, God created us all different. So you are there'll never be another you. Amen. And some of us say, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> and the others will say, oh, my. <laughs> OK, so I just keep that in mind. God made you. The second point, God has the plan for everything you need and want. God has the plan. Some of you trying to figure your lives out, you need to go back to the manual, go back to the workbook. God created you when you're confused or something's not making sense, you need to go back to God. I told you all a couple uh, weeks ago, I was having a hard time with this situation. And I was like, you know what? God, you're going to have to tell me something because I can't, I don't know what to do. And I just curled up in my bed. I said, I'm not coming out until you tell me what to do. I just, 
I got scriptures. I quoted every scripture I could remember. Now, they were from A to Z. <laughs> there was no, I didn't go to like just do the scriptures on healing or whatever. No, I just whatever was in my heart, I just did the scriptures. And then when I ran out of that, I turned on some music and then I go back and listen. OK. And finally, I got my answer. And it was like, uh, would you run that by me again? Because <laughs> it wasn't it's three, four words. He told me what to do. You know, but God has the plan that you need for the situation, for whatever situation it is, good or bad. Your purpose, he has, God has the purpose for your life and the strategy for you to obtain your purpose. Go to James chapter 15. James, no, that's wrong. That's John. I put that down wrong. John, the gospel according to John chapter 15, because James doesn't have 15 chapters. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. The gospel according to John chapter 15. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, let's read it all. Well, no, it'll be too long because I got that, too many verses. Uh, chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. This is Jesus talking. It's in red. And my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now, I need you to visualize Jesus talking about a tree with branches. Husbandman means like the farmer, the cultivator, the landscaper. Okay. So Jesus says he's the vine. His father is the landscaper. Every branch in me, and you're going to see that you are the branches. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he, the father, takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges it. So you would think, okay, you're fruitful. Why is he going to clip you? You know what a purge? Anybody like purging? No. But he says, even if you're doing good, he's going to purge. Clip some more off of you. Okay. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. So until the day you die, you're going to have to keep cutting off the bad or the less productive and be more productive. This is God's plan for your life. Now, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. Remember, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He says it again. So that means get this in your head so it can go down in your heart. You're not the boss of you. And if you're not the boss of you, neither is anybody else the boss of you. Okay? Um, other than, you know, our dear little children. But even then, God has ordained their lives. We're to structure them and focus them, protect them. But technically, they belong to God. He says, I am the vine again. In verse 5, ye are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, Jesus Christ the branch. You can do nothing. If a man, a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, not just fruit, <clears throat> but much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. How many of you are believers? How many of you are disciples? Have you ever heard, I've been listening to different people, and I heard this phrase, a non-believing believer. A non-believing believer. A lot of us have areas that we really don't believe God in. That's called a non-believing believer believer. Let's don't be non-believing believers. 
He says in verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. So evidently, since this is after about the love, it's after the first part, the vine, the branches. Love will keep you abiding in the vine. OK. OK. So um, now let's look at verse 16 and 17, which goes back to the point. God has the plan for everything you need. Jump down to verse 16 and 17. He says, you have not chosen me. Some of you, when you gave your heart to Jesus, you think you did something big deal. You know, whoo, uh, I confessed the Lord and, you know, I got saved. You didn't. I'm the only one in my family saved. I'm the only one living right. You know, I can hear from God. I pray all the time. Jesus says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you again and prepared you. Just think about how good that is. He chose you. You're here because you're special. He chose you. And it's so good that you didn't choose yourself because if he chose you, you don't have to keep yourself. Amen. You don't have to worry about uh, your life. He chose you. Just rest in that. God loves you so much. He's going to bother you. You know how a parent can just get on your last nerves, always trying to get you to do something. You know how you get on your kids last nerves trying to get you. Shauna asked me one day, when are you going to stop parenting me? It was either her or her brothers because they all feel like I'm grown. Well, so what? But God's going to stay on our case. Till I said the day I die is when I quit being a parent. I mean, I don't force, but I'm going to show sure enough, put it in your ear and you're going to have to make a choice. <laughs> you're going to have to choose and you better choose the right thing because I'm going to be right back there. But God loves us. He has a good plan. If he sees a bump in the road, just like you see a bump in the road for somebody who's following you, you'll tell them about it. You'll tell them, make a sharp right, make a smooth right so you don't hit that bump. God has chosen you. Your life has a good destination. Verse 16, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you that you love one another. One of the things that I'm remembering here is that he says that your fruit should remain. There are certain people that God has put in your life. Part of your fruit. And Jesus said in chapter 17, he told God when he was praying his last prayer to God, he says, he says, those that you have given to me, I have kept. I haven't lost one of them. Now, those guys were acting like they didn't know Jesus. They were acting like they was uh, babies, kids and all that. But Jesus had already prayed and secured their destiny, their lives in the father through his prayer and his purpose. His purpose was to save them. Amen. You have people in your life and it's up to you to make sure they get to heaven. Yes, they're sealed by the Holy Ghost. But you know what? A lot of people will not live the life that God planned for them to live if you are not doing what you're supposed to do. Amen. He says he's given you fruit and your fruit should remain. Now, you can do that long distance. You don't have to be in their face. You, it's, it's almost better, especially they grown. Don't be in their face. Do it in the spirit. We are spirit, soul, and body. You don't have to run your mouth. You can do more on your knees, even with children, than you can with your mouth. Because what you're doing is trusting the Father. Lord, you gave me this person. You gave me this spouse. You gave me this child, this grandchild. And I'm going to see that they uh, conform to the image that Jesus um, had, that they are in Jesus. Remember how much Jesus prayed? 
He wasn't praying for himself. He was praying for, for the things that God had given him. How much are you praying or how much are you yik yakking? You know, when, when sometimes maybe God doesn't need you to pull out your wallet. He needs you to go pray for that person to have a miracle so that they can see. I remember having to tell my husband, you know, we're not we're going to have to force our child because we had a child who literally told us, I'm a Toys R Us kid. You know what a Toys R Us kid? They're not going to grow up till they have to. He told me that. So I told my husband, well, you know, we're going to have to force him to go to God instead of going to us. And that's hard because it's easier just to do if you've got the resource. It's easier to do that. But now that he has had to do that, had to learn how to trust in God, he's, he's happy and I'm happy. And I got a whole lot more money. <laughs> okay. Number one, you are God's creation. Number two, God has the plan for everything you need. Number three, my third point, I only have five points. What's on your tree? Now, I'm going to give you a minute. Do you have the, the trees? Okay, put up the good tree. Put up a nice tree for me. What's on your tree? Look at that tree. It's a nice, tall, sturdy, green uh, lots of leaves. Uh, do you have another one? Look at that tree. They're two different trees. Okay. Now, when you think about it, you got another one? Okay. Hmm. Look at that tree. All those trees are different. All of you are different. Now, uh, Show me some more of your other illustrations, and then I can make a comparison. Look at that tree. Hmm. Hmm. It probably needs uh, several things. Look at that tree. It's not dead. Okay. Okay. Look at. Let's look at another tree. Look at that tree. That's a fruit tree, but. Okay, now think about it. What kind of tree are you? Are you an apple tree, maple tree, uh, fig tree, sycamore tree? What are you? How many of us really don't know what kind of tree we are and how in the world can we nourish, nourish that tree and bring forth fruit? You can't grow a palm tree in Michigan, but you really can. A natural palm tree has to be like in Florida or someplace that has moisture and heat. The reason I said I thought about that, you can't grow a palm tree in Michigan, but I think over at Bell Isle at their greenhouse, I think they got a palm tree. And I thought about that. You see that tree on the right side? Um, we have a tree in our backyard. And see, here's the difference about God doing something and mankind doing something. If, that, if there's a tree in its natural habitat, you don't have to touch it. God's going to take care of it. Well, we planted a tree in our backyard, and it looks like the one on the right. And what happened was the first year did okay, second year. This year, I told my husband, I said, something's wrong because we don't have as many blossoms. And then, as the summer went on, there wasn't as much fruit on there. And then as the summer went on, the bark started chipping and stuff like that. And here's the thing. We planted that tree. The soil is not that great. In our area, we have a lot of clay. They took out, they dug up the good dirt and sold it and left the clay. So we have some choices. And just think about your life. I asked the Lord, I said, okay, what kind of tree am I? <laughs> and I came up with a name. And I said, oh, okay, that's pretty good, pretty good. And I really want you to kind of identify this moment. What kind of tree are you? Are you a fruit tree? 
Are you a maple tree? Maple brings forth some expensive syrup. You know how they tap into a maple tree and get maple syrup? That stuff is expensive. What kind of a tree? What are you supposed to be producing? Some people have, I know a couple people here, and I can use Sister Deborah and uh, Carla McGinnis. They're my, they're my, my um, inspiration. Just so pleasant all the time. So they got to have flowers and blossoms on their tree. <laughs> You know, just, they can take any bad situation and just calm it down, you know. And then there are people who like this tree here. It's, it's temporal. You know, in the, in the fall, the leaves are going to change colors and fall off, okay? And then, I guess I, should, I can say this, I think I might be an evergreen tree. <laughs> evergreen is just a I don't get real excited. I don't get real depressed. You know, just a calm all year long, just a sturdy growing tree. Just keep on growing, keep on providing shade, keep on, you know, filling out, that kind of thing. But today, what kind of tree are you? What kind of tree are you? Okay, Matthew 7, 17 says, every good tree brings forth good fruit. Now, how many of you in your lives, there are some things that you really are not satisfied? Don't, this is a rhetorical question. There are some things you're really not satisfied. You need something to change. You need something to get better, or you may even need to just drop some stuff. I, mean, I don't want you to leave here bogged down with more work to do. I want you to realize your good part. You are a tree. Amen. You have been planted. Yes. And you're growing. You might have a lot of leaves. You might have good blossoms. But what did he say? If you're doing good, he's going to purge you. Purging is pain. Most of us, when we run into pain, we're like, get behind me, Satan. Yes. <laughs> but no, it could be God saying, this area is something that you got to cut off now. I heard Brother Copeland say uh, several months ago, he said the Lord told him he had to cut out TV. He knows that TV is not all bad. Um, he, has, he can watch like um, cowboy movies or whatever, whatever, but the, it was distracting him. I had to quit a job. I had to cut that off because there was something that was going on at that job that was, I'd leave upset every day. You know, there are things that got, you may think are bad, and some of you wait till you get fired. I can look at my husband. And, and even, even in statistics, it says that men sometimes will wait. They need to change, but they will wait and almost make a person fire them because they don't have the um, wherewithal or whatever to just quit. People will sometimes just force you to do things so that they can make a change. Even my son, uh, my son worked for um, uh, Pastor Pearson in Texas for years, and we were like, you know, my, I think he worked for like 10 or 12 years as youth pastor. And, you know, sometimes he was happy, sometimes he wasn't, because that's life as you change. And we were thinking, okay, well, you know, your brother got a church and your brother's your brother, or you can come up here with us. He said, no, mom. He says, I'm not doing anything until I hear God. Now, he's our youngest child, and he was in his 20s, and he did it. He did not. He didn't wait for the man to fire him, <laughs> thank God. But he did. He knew it was time for a change, and I even remember when my husband, it was time for him a change. He knew it. I knew it. Bishop Butler knew it. And But, you know, just having that uh, courage to jump off of a cliff and you don't know exactly how deep the water is, you don't know exactly how the temperature is, that takes a whole lot of confidence. And so we are God's workmanship. And when he starts, when you get uncomfortable and stuff in your life isn't working well, is it God purging that away from you? You know, 
Every hard thing is not from the devil. When you look at these situations, almost every disciple had a horrible ending. Okay, so point number three, what's on your tree? Who are you? Um, now we can go to Galatians chapter five and I'm going to read verses um, 16. Da, 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 da. I want to read 16 through 18. And my husband had started with this, I think, earlier in the series about inside out living. And what we're talking about today is really inside out living. Chapter five, verse 16 of Galatians says this. I say, then walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. How many of us want to do something else with our life? It's not God that's holding it back. It's our flesh and the enemy. You live in a world that has a devil that doesn't like you. And he's out to kill you today. If he can kill you today, he will. Do you understand that? It's not those people who are getting on your last nerve. It's not the person that you're ready to commit suicide. That person is not your enemy. It's the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's the devil who's working in that person. <laughs> Verse 18 says, but if ye be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. OK, and then let's go to 19. It says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. OK, so you got a tree. Can you put our tree back up? Any tree? <coughs> Excuse me. So if you have a tree, look at that pretty tree. OK, now let's look at the blossoms on there. Now, if your tree is being um, nurtured by you, your mama, the school, your job, if you're letting all of that uh, feed into your tree, then here's what it's going to look like. So if you see any of this, you know that your tree is getting the wrong stuff. And I'll talk about what the right stuff is in a minute. Verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh. Leave my tree up there because <laughs> I want you to see this tree and see. OK, and just see these little labels on that tree. Adultery. Fornication. And it's amazing how fornication is all over the television. Good Lord. Everybody sleep with everybody. Don't they know about diseases? I mean, at a minimum. But that that's works of the flesh. Fornication. Uncleanness. Now, I'm even going to take this to when you walk in somebody's house and it's filthy, dirty, stinky. That's darkness. When we go to other countries, we can immediately see the work of darkness, dirt, uncleanness. It, that's a work of the enemy. If you remember the Jews, how clean the Jews had to be, they had to just wash their hands, their clothes and over and over and over. Cleanliness will keep you alive longer. So uncleanness is a work of darkness, something that will kill you. Lasciviousness, that's just you do whatever, have it your way, baby. Uh, verse 20, idolatry, that's when people would rather go spend their Sundays <coughs> resting and being leisure because they love themselves more than they love God. Witchcraft, um, you know, when you, um, when you, what's the one? Oh. When the broom hits your foot, you got to spit on it. <laughs> um, just all kind of things. Little superstitions. Little superstitions. That's witchcraft. Hatred. How many of us have to deal with, you just can't stand somebody. Variance. Always got dissension. Always got another opinion. You can't get along. Nobody's smarter than you. You know, don't you just I just get upset when somebody finishes my sentence like I'm so dumb. I can't even come up with a thought that you don't already have. <laughs> really? <laughs> hey. Emulations, wrath, anger, wrath will keep you not producing good trees. Strife. You know, I used to think. 
my grandparents never, I never saw my grandparents argue. But they weren't touchy affectionate. They stayed, you know. So I said, it must be because they don't tell each other the truth. So you need to always discuss everything, whatever it takes. So I had this thing. If I had a disagreement with my husband, if his opinion was one thing and mine was another, it's like, we're going we're gonna to talk about this. And I'm going to make sure I get all of my thoughts out because I don't want it inside. Now, technically, that's strife because he had his opinion. But when I disagreed, I felt that is he, the reason he disagreed because he just didn't know better. So I can help him to know better by giving him all the information. It's just like, Sandy, I'm going to tell on you. One time we were talking and we said, men don't know what's good for them. And most of us women don't think that. You know, like my husband will say something. A lot of times people, their first reaction is no. Well, you know, you say, do you want to go to the store? No. Do you want to buy a car? No. But what they're doing, because I even see this in some of my grandchildren, they're giving themselves, they say no, so that you will shut up. You gave them, a, they gave you an answer, so that they can take time and think about it. And then they'll come back and say, okay, let's do this. But the first thing they say is no. So if you have a, that anger and strife thing, so my thing was you said no. Oh, well, let me tell you why you should say yes. And I will argue you to the ground till you see why you sh should say yes. Well, that's strife. And however people deal with their stuff, they have a right to. All of us are adults. And God is God, not us. I'm not my husband's Holy Spirit. My husband is not my Holy Spirit. In Christ, there is male nor female. There is no, um, you know, we're equal. In Christ, we're equal. So his opinion is just as important as mine. And so I don't need to try to just convince him so, because it creates strife. Then seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, also, as I have also told you in the past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you got some of that stuff on your tree, your tree is not looking like that. Your tree is not healthy. All right. So this tree is verse 22. Now this is now look at those blossoms on that tree. That tree did not bring forth those blossoms. What brought forth those blossoms? God. What? God, okay, the roots of the tree brought forth the fruit of the tree. That tree cannot bring forth those things unless it's already in the roots. Um, if that's a flowering tree, it can't bring forth uh, pine cones because it's not a pine tree. So every tree, whatever the roots are, that's what's going to manifest in the tree. Whatever your roots are, that's what's going to manifest in your life. If you're a peach tree, you're going to bring forth peaches. If you're a thorn tree, and thorn trees are necessary in certain places, you're going to bring forth that fruit. But your fruit, can't, you can't make your fruit. God made you the kind of tree that you are. Do you get that? You know, if you're Sister Deborah, she's all that. Well, sometimes, you know, I couldn't go there because I'm just, that's just not the way I think it's going to get the job done. You know, being nice and kind. Well, sometimes she could never do what I do. You know, get the job done by whatever means necessary. <laughs> okay. But God made us who we are. And a couple points I want to give to you then. If God made your child to be quiet, don't try to make them rowdy, always wanting to talk, talk, talk. If, you're, if God made your child rowdy, don't always try to quiet them down. One of the things that happened to me in um, London, uh, I taught the Bible school and, and I I t of course, I always change the curriculum. They gave me one curriculum. Like, okay, this ain't working over here. I got to fix it. So I did this curriculum, and there was a, um, there's a personality type of, what is it, uh, sanguine. There's a, and there was a girl 
who she one day she come to class she have red hair the next week she'd have black hair and then she'd have all of this you know she just switch it up all the time she had on all these you know clothes that were whatever whatever and we finally covered that personality and she said after those several weeks that we did that she said this whole year was worth me finding out there's nothing wrong with me it was in her personality god gave her that personality another woman and and they're the pastor over there now the same thing her husband found out she's not just loud and rowdy and crazy that was her personality that god gave her now as a parent just cause one, you can't treat every child the same. Every, I have four children. Each one of them has a separate personality. You know, there are four personality types. We got all four. So for me to do to one what I did to the other would be a disservice, not only to them, but for God's purpose in their lives. Because I would have broken their spirit, trying to make them act like something to be accepted to me. Okay? So... Each of us, we're God's creation, we're God's trees, but you can't bring forth fruit. You shouldn't be trying to act like something that you're really not. I don't need to be trying to act quiet. You know, when I first got here, I spent I don't know how many years trying to be quiet and meek and mealy mouth and all of that stuff. And finally, you know, I sat down and I asked the Lord, I said, okay, okay. And it was like, he showed me, okay, we live in the country. You cannot be talking soft in the country. You got to holler if somebody's going to hear you because we're in a lot of space. You know, uh, there were, what, six or seven women in the house. If you mealy mouth, you're never going to be heard. You know, you got to speak up. We all talking at the same time. <laughs> okay. So God gives us the distinctions of who we are, and we have to love ourselves and love other people. Let that tree be what it wants to be. Maybe it has blossoms. Maybe it has leaves. Maybe uh, it, it will be summertime one way, wintertime another. All right. Okay, I'm almost coming. I'm coming to a close. My husband said, I'm fitting to fit and to quit. Okay. So uh, what's on your tree? Who are you? Who's been messing with your tree? Verse 22 the fruit of the spirit is love. How loving are you? Do people are do are they do they just walk up to you and talk, say things? How loving is that spirit in you? How much joy do you have? Can you just be happy with yourself all day? Absolutely. You know? <laughs> that could be a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> joy. Joy comes from the spirit. You can't conjure up joy. You can't conjure up love. Long suffering. You know, there, I, I'm just amazed that I've been a married 49 years. I didn't have any long suffering. You know, I came into marriage. I'm going to give him seven years. He don't act right. I'm out of here. Starting on number two. Give him seven. I'm supposed to be on my sixth or seventh husband by now. And lo and behold, I've been stuck with that one, <laughs> trying to get that one right. But long-suffering is a fruit of the Spirit. I've learned to stop and be long-suffering. Gentleness. You know, I didn't come from a gentle family. You know, the roots of my family tree are not gentle. You get it done. Whoever you got to kill in the pathway, get it done. We don't take no for an answer. All right. I had to learn gentleness. Do you need to learn gentleness? Because this is the fruit of God's spirit in you. Goodness. How many of us are good? Does somebody have to pay you for everything you do? You know, what do you do that you're not going to get a thank you for? How good are you really? If you if that's not one of your fruits, these are the things that are supposed to be on our tree. Faith, is should, and faith here means faithfulness. If you tell me something, can I count on you? How much can I, will you go with me to the end of the road? You know, I look at some people, and maybe this is just, again, my personality. When somebody gets sick, you need to follow them to their last breath if you are faithful. And so many friends, I remember my friend, when she got sick, 
the woman she considered her best friend wouldn't go to see her because she couldn't stand to see her in that condition. Isn't that just selfish? I'm getting ready to leave this earth and you can't come see me. Well, you're not my friend. Like the kids say, you're not my friend. <laughs> so if you're my friend, you know, be faithful. OK, meekness. Wow. Meekness is a, a um, Moses was the meekest man in the Old Testament. Meekness means somebody can tell you something. And it means something to you. How many times I look at the young kids these these days and I feel so sorry for them because a lot of what causes you to not be meek is fear. But once you get established, the things when you get established in the love of God, you will have this peace and long suffering because you're trusting in God for the outcome and not your works. But meekness is being able to be taught something, something teachable. If, if, if I go to um, if I'm if we're having a conversation and I'm trying to tell you how to um, cook a cake. Don't keep saying, oh, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Well, if you know, let me quit wasting my time. You know, you know how some people, when you're talking to them, I know, I know, I know. Well, if you know, bye. <laughs> let me go help somebody else. So we have to learn how to be meek. And a lot of times, especially with spouses, the spouse will tell you something and you never hear it. That is not meekness. If the spouse keeps saying the same thing over and over and over, something's wrong. We got to learn how to hear it and then go to God and say, OK, what do I do with this? Temperance, which is self-control. Now, this is one where we really don't want God to deal with us about self-control. Maybe it's in spending, eating, talking, working. Do you have self-control? Is that one of your strong fruits? All of these things are supposed to be on our tree against these things. We're supposed to have love. Let's all read 22 together. But the fruit. Wait a minute. Hold on. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such. There is no law. So if you work on letting those things are already in your spirit. If you're a born again Christian, they're in there. But if you're letting the other stuff have dominion, you know, the evil stuff that we read up in verse uh, 19 and 20, if you it's a choice. Just like I said, we put a tree in the wrong place and not a good place. But if you put the tree where God tells you to put it or you let the tree grow naturally, it will blossom. If um, out here in the backyard, there's, you know, the asphalt, right? OK, so last year we had some petunias. Now, a petunia is the little flowery, cute flower that you're supposed to really plant every year. But every seed has in itself. If it if God has the opportunity to nurture that seed, it will produce. That seed, some of the seeds, which we bought more this year, but some of them evidently, when those old ones died, fell into the asphalt. Now, there has been salt back there. There was snow, cars, people walking. But don't you know there were some flowers that poked up through that asphalt and they are still living because of God watered them, whether it's drought or whatever. God gave the sun and he gave the, the climate, and he will always do that. He says as earth, as long as the earth remains, there will be seed and harvest. You are a tree that he will manifest the fruit of the spirit in you. His spirit is living in you. You are created in Christ Jesus. Don't keep being mean and evil and poor and sick. Amen. It's dumb. Amen. It's dumb. I tell you, I'm going to kick it. If I got to kick the door down, you know, my husband ain't going nowhere to. I'm ready for him to go. The devil, the devil, don't. you don't owe the devil anything. God gave Eve a promise. You are, you are of that promise. Your seed will bruise Satan's head. Quit letting the devil choose what you have in your life. 
Some women want a man, a better man, or no man. <laughs> Find out what's on your tree. <laughs> you know they're trying to get rid of the one they got. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm almost finished. Okay, number four. <coughs> Excuse me, it says, who's been messing with your tree? How to be a healthy, fruitful tree. Galatians chapter 5, just drop down there to verses uh, 24, 25. How to be a healthy, fruitful tree. So if you got that other mess growing on your tree, God has been trying to prune it and take it off of you. Let him shut your mouth. Say, I'm sorry. Forgive. <sighs> you can trust God. You're not going to lose anything. You're not going to. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've said I'm sorry to my husband. And I'd rather go ahead and say I'm sorry and truly forgive him and start afresh because I don't have that junk on the inside of me. You know, I'm sure not enough not bragging, but every time I go to the doctor, they say, uh, you on any med? What's your, what meds are you on? Zero. I probably take a sleeping pill because I don't go to sleep fast enough. I want to go to sleep now. Not 30 minutes later, or I might take an ibuprofen if I've been working too hard. No, and I'm not saying, I'm not bragging, I'm not saying it's because of this, but I think a lot of it's because I don't keep that crap in me. I learned years ago to have instant forgiveness. You can't change what somebody else thinks about you, and grown-ups are grown. They got a right to do exactly what they, don't, what they want to do. If you don't like it, you get out of their environment. But you better not go unless God tells you to go, because they might be in your life for a reason, especially your spouse. OK, how to be a healthy and fruitful tree. Galatians chapter five, verse 24 says, and they that are Christ have done what? Crucified. The flesh crucified the flesh. If you got this junk on you up in verses 19, 20 and 21, it's because you haven't crucified the flesh. You know, um, with the affections and lusts, 25, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. One of the things I used to do, the job that I had to quit, uh, we always had to be out in the hallway to greet the students when they came in. So there was this one new teacher. I think she's a counting teacher. She's a little young something. Oh, she was really about our age. But she would go work out and, you know, she'd eat her little healthy stuff at lunch. And me and my friends, we'd be down at the uh, dining room seeing how much could we get and, you know, put in our bag to take home because they had this real fancy dining room. We just eating up a storm, right? So this little Miss Thang, she would just always do her stuff and exercise. And we used to uh, look at her and, you know, uh, the, the boys would always flirt with it. We just say, yicky, yicky, yicky. And one day, you know, uh, the light dawned on me. And I told them what the, the light told me. <laughs> she earned that shape. We sitting up eating everything in sight. And she doing what she uh, wanted to do to earn that. She had a right to that. You know? So... Crucify your flesh. Start with your mouth, because that's where your power is. Start with your mouth. Don't let anything come out of your mouth that's not something that God wants you to say. Jesus says, I only do and say what the Father tells me. Now, you know he got upset a few times. He got upset a few times and told people, you know, you were... Uh, no good, and you know, you're like white sepulchers, and he knocked the money off the thing, you know. But he says he only did what the Father said. Start with your mouth, because life and death is in the power of the tongue. And, and the other scripture in James says that your tongue, it controls your whole ship, your whole tree, your mouth. Put some gum in it and keep chewing. <laughs> okay? It's, it, that's real simple, how to have a healthy tree. Okay? Uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 33 says, either, this again, Jesus talking to you, make the tree good, 
It's up to you. And his fruit good or else the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. Now, you know, you don't call tre trees his and her, do you? You don't use a pronoun. A tree is a what? An it, impersonal pronoun. But he, here he's liking us to trees. So ha, to make a healthy tree. So how else do you do this? Because I said it, it, it depends on what's in the roots. OK, so James chapter three. Let's go to James chapter three. James chapter three. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? So remember, I asked you, what kind of tree are you? And what are you trying? What are you doing? Are you, are you an apple tree and you out here acting like an olive? <laughs> Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive be berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Now, oh, I used to see this back in the day. <laughs> Even my grandmother. You heard Tyler Perry talk about, hello. Well, back in the day, we had those phones, you know, the dial-up phones and the cords. And for some reason, I remember all the church people, hello, hello. And I'm like, this is not how you talk. You know, hello, hello. You want somebody to think you proper. <laughs> so that's where Tyler Perry got that, hello, hello. Because we would all change ourselves. I would see people at church act one way, and they treat their families like I don't know what. You know, um, that didn't happen at our house, thank God, because <laughs> that's why I'm so uh, realistic and down to earth. At our house, we didn't play that. You had to be real. Either they'll call you out. Oh, you're being phony. You know, so that's why I'm pretty much down to earth. But so many people, I would see them at church, you know, big churches and stuff, especially when you got this, the titles and all this stuff. And then I see them somewhere else, and they're really, really not at all what they had been. So you can't have it both ways. You're either going to be a fig tree or an olive berry. OK, so what kind of tree are you? And I really wish I could just find out what kind of tree are you. So be a healthy, fruitful tree. Um, Verse 13, who is wise man and endued with knowledge among you. You think you're so smart. Show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. The wisdom that descends not from above, that wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Now, here's, here's the judge, here's the telling you the truth. If you want to know what you're doing is right, look at this. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Because the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. I love it how much, you know, God gives you a spouse that you need. And I love it how much so my husband, when we first got married, he wouldn't, as they say, he wouldn't contest me. As they say, he wouldn't really talk back to me. He'd say what he had to say. And that was that. And so over the years after I, well, you need to, you know, let me help you understand because you were walking in darkness. I'm going to help you walk in the light. Now, this is the truth about the matter. Blah, 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 blah. And I remember I talked him into doing a few things and they were bad decisions. And then I got mad at him because he did them. I said, well, you, why did you do that? You know, I didn't know. <laughs> but what I have learned over the years to truly appreciate in him is I'll say, um, let's buy a new uh, kitchen set. He'll say, mm, no, I don't think so. Or no, he won't say no. He'll say, well, why do you need one? So then I'll go around, come back again. Let's get uh, something different for this room. You know, I bring it back a different way. He'll say, well, you know, I don't really think that that would fit right here. Rather than to just tell me no straight up, he would, get, he would just say, he would give me a question or something like that. 
And then the third time I bring it back, because I'm going to bring it back another way that's more feasible, because he really don't see the light, you know, and I got to show him, you know. Well, we got five grandkids that need to sit at this table and something, something, something. And he would say, well, if you want to get it, get it. But I think so and so and such and such. So what that does, what I've learned to appreciate is his opinion out of his resources is saying, not now. Because I know he doesn't hate me. And I know that if I went on and bought it, he, he'd just let it go. I wouldn't hear about it again. But what I've learned is like, ooh, I better go back to God and see is this what I need and is this the right timing? Okay? He doesn't force his issue like me. You know, I'm going to keep on to, I'm going to do like my son. I'm going to keep on until you say yes. You know, keep bringing it back a different way. You know, my child said, and this I'm closing. My son, my, um, how old was the boy? He was like, Four, no, maybe like 10, 11, 12. He says, Mom, you know, uh, go by, will you go buy me this? And I said, no, I don't have any money. That means I really don't want you. To, now, this is my feminine language. No, I really don't want you to have that. So I'm going to tell you I don't have the money. Okay. He'll say, well, uh, use the card. And I'll say, well, <laughs> no, uh, I don't have money. He'll say, well, you write a check. And i say, well, no, you know, I just really still don't have the money. He'll say, well, go ask Dad. So, and I said, well, what does no mean to you? He says, and he was, he was just being an innocent child. He says, no means keep on asking until you say yes. Okay. So, but we have to learn how we have to function within the tree that God has given us. The last scripture that we're having, and my last point is, uh, God is the master gardener and he wants you to help fix you. I don't want you leaving here today thinking that you got to be worked on, you got to be fixed and all that, because God truly, truly loves you. And some of us have been beaten up so much by life. And there's um, the tree that I was talking about in our backyard. The bark is coming off. And one of the things that happened is the people who cut the grass, not talking about you, Gerald, take the weed whacker and get too close to the tree. And that messes with the bark at the bottom. And you know, the bark is what transmits, uh, transfers the, the moisture up to the tree. And over time, that not getting the proper moisture because of somebody else doing something. Also, you know, when you don't have proper soil, you got to fertilize. We didn't fertilize the thing. So God, you know, there are things in, in our life that have happened not because of our own doing. Some of them were because of bad choices, but there are some things that people did to you that there was nothing you could do about it. But God is the master planner. He's the master gardener. He knows exactly how much uh, fertilizer, how much water, how much sunshine you need. And he has put you in that place. And if you're not in that place, he will acclimate you to that to get to the position that he wants you to be in. He wants you to go forth and bring forth fruit. But let him prune those areas in your life that need to be pruned. Yes. You know, quit lying. Quit cheating. Come quit being lazy. Amen. You know, when he wants you to do good, don't be afraid to do good. Give it to him and close the door. Don't expect a return. Because there's some good, there's good stuff in you, but you got to just trust God to let his love flow through you. God is a master gardener. In Luke chapter 13, my last verses, verse 6 through 9, he says, And he told this parable, which is Jesus. A man had a fig tree that was planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it and found none. He told the vineyard worker, um, he told the vineyard worker, Listen, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this tree. For three years. And haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it even waste the soil? And you know, there have been times God said, I'm going to wipe out humanity. Because they're not, their hearts are evil. So, and here the, the, the uh, he said, cut this tree down because it's taking up too much space. Verse 8, but here's what the vineyard, this is what Jesus says to God. Sir, leave it this year. 
also until I dig around it, the Holy Spirit, and fertilize it. Perhaps it will bear fruit next year, and if it doesn't bear fruit, we'll cut it down. You know, don't lose your gifts and talents because you won't take care of them, because you don't fertilize them. You know, they said use it or lose it, and it's the truth. God has given you gifts, talents. He's given you seed. He's given you a soil. He makes sure the sun shines, the rain comes, and the, the soil will do what it's commanded to do. But you got to keep all the weed whackers and the diseases off your plants, off your trees. Be that good tree that God created you to be. Be fruitful. Be loving. Be kind. Let somebody teach you something. You know, be meek and long-suffering. Amen? Amen? God bless you. Have a good week. So Brother Thompson is going to come now and offer and take us into the rest of the service. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to the Salvation Temple broadcast. We'd like to invite you to our weekly services. Sunday mornings at 10.45 a.m. and Thursday evenings at 6.15 p.m. We look forward to seeing you at Salvation Temple Church where the focus is on you.